here. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, recent work with Moshe Rosali at UBC, and perhaps some work in progress. Um, let me give you some of the main statements of this talk from the beginning. Um, the, the first point I would like to convey is that the physics, at least of maximal chaos, of maximally chaotic systems, has some, some universality to it uh, that allows us to describe it using effective field theory methods. Um, one, that, so the famous example of this is what happens in the SYK model and in JT gravity. And I'm going to argue that uh, something similar works in two-dimensional conformal field theories. We have some universal description that is like an effective field theory of, uh, of chaos. Uh, the reason this is useful is, of course, because this, this, uh, this gives you some very simple description of a process that is a priori very complicated and very fine-grained. But if you can describe it in terms of some few effective field theory degrees of freedom, uh, that, gives you, that gives you powerful tools to study this physics. The second, the second point of my talk will be a particular, so one particular application of this formalism, uh, which is, I, I would like to show you that it allows you to compute, for instance, a higher point out of time order correlation functions in a very simple way. So you can arbi almost arbitrarily high point correlation functions of some particular form you can calculate using this, this formalism. And if I have time, I might have some comments on this. OK, so since this is a broad audience, let me give you a very brief reminder of some uh, facts about the SYK model, which is this, this model of n Majorana fermions interacting in, interacting in, this, in this way, say, with, a, with this coupling between four fermions. And the, the couplings are chosen randomly from some Gaussian ensemble. So the, the interesting, an interesting parameter here is, is the, this curly J that determines the Gaussian ensemble. And the SYK model in the infrared develops a, a conformal symmetry, which is, which is a, a reparameterization symmetry. Uh, which, so but, so the, the, the action has the symmetry, but the, the conformal solution does not respect that symmetry. It only respects a, an SL2 part of it which means you have a spontaneous breaking of that symmetry that leads to zero modes and some gauge-like symmetry uh, that would naively give you divergences if you compute correlation functions. So to, uh, to get a handle of this, you have to um, include uh, effects. You, you have to include small non-conformal effects and add a small action that explicitly breaks this, this SL2 symmetry. And this is the, this is this Schwarzian action. So you see this, this Schwarzian derivative respects the, an SL2 R symmetry, but it's not reparameterization invariant. And it is formulated in terms of just a single degree of freedom, which is this reparameterization mode. Now, this, uh, this mode and the effects described by the Schwarzian action give you precisely the, the interesting contribution to the four-point function, to the out-of-time order four-point function, uh, say, of this type. This, this contribution is enhanced in, in beta j in the sense that you would naively get an infinite answer. But now you get a finite but order beta j answer because you have included these Schwarzian effects. And you get something that exponentially increases. Now, I want to say something about uh, this, this degree of freedom f. It is, in some sense, a hydrodynamic mode uh, not in the traditional sense, but in the sense that it captures something about energy conservation. Or if you think, think about doing the OPE between two of these fermions, pairwise two of these fermions, uh, there is an, there's like an energy mode that gets exchanged, which is responsible for this growth. Uh, th this has been, so th this has been uh, conjectured at a, uh, uh, more generally in this paper that, that uh, this effect, that there might be an effective field theory of, of this energy mode, of more general energy modes in, in more general systems, which captures the Lyapunov growth of maximally chaotic systems. Uh, and we will see an example of that. Okay, so that's, 
that's the background, that's, that's the, the Schwarzian action. Now, in this talk, I want to, I want to tell you about two-dimensional conformal field theories uh, in a particular regime. So we, we need to make certain assumptions about these conformal field theories, which probably unsurprisingly are the sort of assumptions that you require if you want a holographic description. So first of all, we need a large central charge. And then if you also assume the dominance of the vacuum block, which I can be more precise about later what that means, uh, it, it was realized in this paper that, that you can derive a maximal Lyapunov exponent in this stress energy sector of a four point function in two dimensional conformal field theories. Now, instead of using explicitly these, these conformal blocks, um, I will use a slightly different idea, which is to, to formulate a, an effective field theory that is effective in a, in a large C sense. So an expansion parameter will be one over C. But it is in some sense an effective field theory of the vacuum block of, of stress tensor exchanges. And the dynamical degrees of freedom of this field theory will be, will be the modes that are associated with the spontaneous breaking of conformal symmetry. Uh, yeah. So, so you can already see this is very similar to what happens in the Schwarzen theory. Um, let me highlight uh, very few points that are, that are conceptually different before I, I get to, into some formalism. So in, in some sense, the, this theory will be more universal than the Schwarzian because I don't have to specify the theory. I can, I can talk about a large class of two-dimensional CFTs. Uh, but in some sense, it's also less universal because we need, we need to make sure that, uh, that this uh, stress tensor exchanges or whatever is described by the identity block actually dominates the correlation functions that we compute, say. And for, for this to, to be true, you need to assume something like a large gap in, this, in the spectrum. I'm not sure in what sense it's more universal because the, the short term is probably universal for any theory that has this nearly conformal symmetry measure, right? So it's yeah, if, the, if that's true, then right. So then it's just a, a higher dimensional version of that story, maybe. Yeah. The symmetry will not be explicitly broken by the theory I'm going to write down. Um, okay, let me describe the theory. Uh, so in this paper, I also want to highlight these two papers. The, the first paper, uh, similar ideas have been, ha have been put forward, and then this paper that appeared on the same day as ours, where a complementary uh, point of view is described from the, from the ADS3 point of view. Um, I, may, yeah, I may have some comments about that, if time permits. So, so consider a two-dimensional conformal field theory at finite temperature and study uh, reparameterizations. So in, in some coordinate systems, Z and Z bar, which, uh, so, so they, if, if these are just uh, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic functions, these are just the usual conformal transformations uh, and describe the symmetry that's generated by the, by the standard currents. But by, so by giving them a small dependence on giving these modes some small dependence on the other co coordinate, on the anti-holomorphic coordinates in, in case of epsilon, say, um, you get some, you get something that's effectively like a, like a source for energy momentum. And what I have in mind here when I write this line is doing, doing the, the CFT path integral in the presence of these sources. Uh, now, um, so, so now, okay, I do the path integral in the presence of these sources, but what I want to study is in some sense the dynamics of these epsilon modes. So you do some, you do some Legendre transformation and write down an effective action, the, the, the standard effective action for, for these modes. So we, 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 uh, we're writing a dynamical theory for these epsilon modes. We treat them as Goldstone modes associated with the conformal symmetry breaking due to having, due to the fact that there is no, that there's no conformally invariant uh, vacuum or, or thermal state. Now, so you get an, 
a term like this in the path integral, which gives you an effective action at, at any order you like in these epsilon modes. And this action is, is determined by the conformal symmetry, at least to some extent. At least, so at least perturbatively, if I write down the, the resulting effective action at second order, I have two insertions of these uh, anti-holomorphic derivatives of epsilon, and each of them comes with a stress tensor. And in, in the effective action, the whole thing is ta uh, you take the expectation value of the whole thing. So the the quadratic action for these for these uh, reparameterization modes is determined by the two-point function of the energy momentum tensor, which of course is universal. It's determined by the conformal symmetry. So you can, you can insert here what this two-point function is and, and massage this effective action, and you will, you will find that it is actually a local action which takes this form in, in, in some position space. So, so this action, this action is, looks very familiar because it, it almost looks like the Schwarzian action. So those of you who have studied the Schwarzian action will recognize that if, if you just drop this sigma derivative here, or if, if you drop all sigma dependence to some naive dimensional reduction, then this is precisely the quadratic approximation to the Schwarzian. The difference being that we now have this uh, additional dependence on space and some second copy that has to do with the anti-holomorphic reparameterization modes. Um, okay. Uh, Jump. So if you, if you invert this quadratic action, you get a, a propagator for this mode. In Euclidean signature, this propagator looks like this. Uh, again, in the Schwarzian theory, you would get the same propagator, but without this IK. So again, it's very similar. And also, in a, in a similar way, it has an interesting pole structure. In particular, the fact that you have this pole here at, at 1 in Euclidean signature is what eventually gives you the exponentially growing modes. Um, now, I, I could uh, keep discussing this theory in, a, in the same way as the Schwarzin, but let me give you a slightly different perspective, because this, uh, this theory also allows us to explore a little bit how to do uh, Lorentzian conformal field theory. So I, I want to discuss uh, the following things in, in Lorentzian signature. Just to, give a, just to give a different perspective. So instead of working with this Euclidean propagator, you can uh, do the Fourier transform of that in, in real time and get a real time schwinger keldish propagators for this mode. So like an, a retarded propagator that I wrote down here and an advanced propagator and a symmetric propagator and so on. So here the retarded propagator, you can see it, it's, retarded in the sense that it satisfies retarded boundary conditions. Um, and it has exponentially growing modes here. So it has support on positive times, where this is an exponentially growing mode, uh, as long as uh, the spatial coordinate sigma would be negative in this case. The, the advanced propagator was sort of complementary to that. So, so we can work with this propagator to compute, to compute uh, interesting things, which we will do in a second. Um, before, before we can compute correlation functions, um, we, need to, we need to understand how to couple this theory to, to other operators, to primary operators, O in the conformal field theory. And this works, so this works exactly in the same way as you could do this in the, in the Schwarzen theory, just to do it in two dimensions. The conformal symmetry again tells you how these reparameterization modes have to couple to, to bilinears of, uh, of primary operators in the CFT, and that they, uh, that um, the conformal symmetry also tells you that the reparameterization modes couple to that in the first place, because they, they act like a reparameterization of this conformal two-point function, which takes this familiar form. So, so we have a natural set of bilocal operators that look very familiar. Um, which, which coupled to this, to this Goldstone modes. Now we're interested in a, in a particular reparameterization, this one, which this exponential takes us to the thermal state, and then we consider these uh, small, uh, small deviations from the 
uh, from, from the exact thermal Z. So if you, if you do this particular transformation on these uh, by locals, you get this form, which is also familiar from, uh, from the lower dimensional discussions, which essentially gives you the Feynman rules for coupling these, this mode to, to matter, to, to operators. So you, you expand this expression in epsilon and gives you a first order term and a second order term and so on that tell you how to couple uh, various numbers of these fields to, to the bilocal. Okay, so, so we have some simple Feynman rules that we can do cal calculations with. Now, what, what, what sort of things can we calculate with this? And that's, that's sort of the point of this, uh, of this project, that we would like to argue that uh, you can use this to do certain calculations in a very simple way. Uh, so let me first, yeah, I think, so I have some time, so let me briefly um, say something about uh, conformal blocks that have been studied in this paper by Jordan, who's here, and Kristen Jensen. And then in some more detail, I would like to talk about out of time autocorrelation functions. So just briefly, in order to show you what this theory can do, it is engineered as, an, as a theory that encodes energy momentum exchanges. So it is really a theory of the, of the Virasor identity block. So you would expect that you can uh, reproduce the physics of that block, and, and that's indeed uh, correct. So one example is the light-light four-point block that was first studied here. Light-light uh, is the limit where, well, it's this limit where the operator dimensions are at most of order uh, root c. In that case, uh, some Euclidean four-point function takes this universal form, and then this bracket is the, the vacuum block contribution, and then there are other blocks, which this theory in, in the current form does not describe. To compute the vacuum block, you just sum all the Feynman diagrams using these rules that I described, which are dominant in this limit. So all these, all these, all these diagrams are of the same order, or are, 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 or co contribute that in the same sense in this in this light light limit, so you sum all of them and you recover the the known answer for the light light block. And you can do something similar for the for the heavy light block, that is uh, that is interesting because it has to do with uh, studying the um, a black hole created by the heavy states of order which have dimension of order c. So so they also recovered the. Uh, the heavy light uh, results using similar techniques, uh, including one over C corrections, and, and the point the point really being that these calculations are really simple. It's it's, it's very simple to calculate these these diagrams and get these answers that that are otherwise more complicated uh, to obtain. So so the hope for the future, I guess, would be can you can you take this further and can you get new results about say conformal blocks using these techniques. Okay, so now let me talk about um, uh, the thing that we looked at, which is out of time order correlation functions. And of course, once I tell you that this theory describes the vacuum block, then you would expect that it describes these out of time order correlation functions, at least in the case where the vacuum block dominates, or at least that, that part of it. Um, so, so here is a bit of review. This, if we look at this out of time order correlation function, which is represented on some complex time contour down here, it starts with some order one value, but then around some scrambling time t star, there's of order log of the number of degrees of freedom, the central charge I should write, I guess, uh, it, uh, it, this other contribution starts growing. And as, as you know, this has been posed as a measure of quantum chaos, and in particular, this Lyapunov exponent satisfies some fundamental bound. Now, contrast this with the time-ordered correlation function, where, the, where these are along the time, so I have switched the position of this w and this v in the middle, which means I can actually represent the whole thing on a smaller uh, contour. Right? So I only need one switch back to represent that. And more formally, this means the, that you lose this exponential growth. You just get the factorized answer. Um, now, I, I just want to 
say something that's going to matter about taking this commutator, so taking the difference between the OTARC and the, and the time ordered correlation function. This difference, first of all, just extracts the exponentially growing behavior, which is the part we're interested in. And let me give you a very intuitive argument for why it is easy to calculate in the case that we put a commutator here. Okay, this is not precise, this is just to give you some intuition. So if you think of, um, say on this contour, the V's exchanging these modes, these reparameterization modes with the W's, then in some sense they all go forward along the contour. Right? Every, every exchange that goes from V to W goes forward along the contour, so it's like a, a it's like it's like a forward propagation. It's like the the plus propagator in the Schwinger-Kedish sense. Whereas in this out of time order correlation function on the left, there is one mode that goes from the V operators to the W operators, which travels backwards on the contour. Okay, so if I if I take the difference between the two, then the left hand side is like three times taking the plus propagator that travels forwards. <laughs> and once taking the, the minus propagator travels backwards along the contour, whereas here I always, always go forwards. So I end up roughly with a difference between these two, which is like a retarded propagator of that, of that mode that's being exchanged here. So, okay. so there's a way to make that more precise, but um, my point here is simply that taking this commutator effectively amounts to exchanging a retarded mode between uh, a retarded uh, reparameterization mode propagator. Um, right. So, so more generally, you can you can ask questions about more general uh, out of time order correlation functions, and you you can ask whether whether they encode any interesting physics if you have more insertions. Uh, these being the most familiar cases, and then by k I label the number of uh, pairs of legs in this contour. Now one, one statement, one combinatorical statement is that not every, every correlation function that I write down on such a k-o-t-o contour is actually k-o-t-o in the sense that I need that many switchbacks in time. Uh, this is due to this fundamental relation that the, the future most operator on such a contour, I have a choice whether I put it on the top or the bottom uh, part of this uh, uh, leg of this part of the contour. Um, we refer to this as the largest time equation, so just a statement that the difference of inserting it on the top half versus the, the backwards half of the contour vanishes. And this, these kind of relations really encode unitarity of the theory because uh, these go back to the fact that that you unitarily evolve. So this, this part of the contour beyond the latest insertion is sort of, uh, doesn't do anything. Uh, here's a combinatorial statement that the number of ways to represent any, any correlation function that is, that is an endpoint function uh, and it's, it's properly QOTO in the sense that it requires a minimum of Q of these uh, switchbacks if you represent that on a contour with perhaps more legs, 2k of those legs, uh, then the problem is purely combinatorical. Uh, the number of ways to do that is a function only of these numbers q, n, and k, but it has nothing to do with the particular insertions. So, so now you can ask, uh, is there, do, do these correlation functions encode any interesting physics beyond what we can already learn from the, from the four-point function? <coughs> Uh, okay, I guess I already said that the, the four-point function has this particular scrambling time that goes like the logarithm of the, cent of, of the central charge. I will now describe a, a generalization of this which displays a longer equilibration time scale. So the statement will be that there, there are higher point out of time order correlation functions and they are different from the four-point function in the sense that their characteristic time scale is longer it scales with k, with the number of insertions. Uh, the particular observable that I have in mind is uh, illustrated here. 
So of course, there are many correlation functions I could write down. I will try to argue why, why this one is particularly nice. Um, so, well, first of all, it's maximally, K, maximally OTO in the sense that there's no way of putting these 2K operator insertions on a contour with fewer switchbacks. And it's maximally braided in Euclidean time in the sense that if you project this, this whole picture here onto the Euclidean time axis, all these bilocals are, are interlinked, are braided with each other. And moreover, what I'm going to do is put commutators around each of these pairs of operators, which is a generalization of what I demonstrated in the case of the four-point function. And so mathematically, this subtracts out certain, certain uh, lower order terms that we're not interested in. It, it extracts for us really just the exponential growth that we want to see. But uh, for, as far as the calculation is concerned, these, these commutators basically do, do the same thing as in case of the four-point function. They ensure that all that propagates between any, any pair of operators here is like a retarded propagator of, the, of, of that reparameterization mode. And that makes, makes the calculation very simple. So, so now you can go and use, use these insights to actually calculate this thing. And you will find that it scales, it, well, it behaves like this. So, so it, expon it grows exponentially with the same Lyapunov exponent as the four-point function. Um, and at the same time, it is more suppressed than 1 over n. So that should be obvious because the, it's just a connected part of a higher point function. So of course, it will be more suppressed. It will be suppressed by a power of k minus 1 in 1 over n. So, so the second point is obvious. The first point, I think, is not obvious that the, that the rate of growth has not changed. And, and the combination of these two facts makes sure that, that the associated time scale is really uh, um, k minus 1, the original scrambling time. Had, so had the Lyapunov exponent, had, so had, had the, the speed of this growth also grown, then this would have not been the case, and the, the, um, the characteristic time scale for this exponential growth would have been just the same scrambling time as for the four-point function. That would have been boring, but, but this is not the case. There's a, there's a longer time scale associated with it. And moreover, this whole correlation function, the way it's built, it only depends on the difference between the, the time of the first and the last insertion. Um, so we have calculated this thing in the, in the Schwarzian theory and using these uh, Lorentzian techniques that I showed in, in two-dimensional CFTs. The result is basically the same in both cases. Uh, in 2D CFTs, of course, there's additional dependence on the spatial direction. So there's a, there's a butterfly velocity, which is, which is one. Uh, but but es essentially, it looks, it looks like this. And again, it's interesting to use methods which are from the beginning Lorentzian as opposed to calculating this in, in Euclidean signature and analytically continuing in the end. And somehow we, in, in this 2D CFT framework, we can, we can explore how to do that using, using the stringer Keldish propagators of the, of the reparameterization mode directly. Okay, so, so here is, uh, again, two, two statements to take away from this. Um, that you can formulate a theory that's very similar to the Schwarzen theory in two-dimensional CFTs, which is again a theory of reparameterization modes. And this theory is useful in the sense that it allows you to calculate uh, um, statements about the, the identity block, about quantum chaos, and, uh, and, and the, all, the, all these effects that come from the OPE in a, in a very simple way. Uh, the, the second point was this example about out of time order correlation functions with more insertions displaying some hierarchy of scrambling time scales. So somehow be, that they are sensitive to some more fine grained version of, of this quantum chaotic uh, scrambling of information. So here, here is one question uh, that I want to put in, in the room. 
I'd, like, I'd be happy to talk about. Um, the, the next question in this program will be, can, can we use this effective field theory to go beyond the case of maximal chaos? So all this, all this universality and the fact that maximal, uh, the fact that the, this energy mode somehow describes the Lyapunov behavior seems to have, seems to be intimately connected with the fact that we're talking about maximally chaotic theories. So, and SYK is the, the obvious example where this is actually not, not what happens, but you have, you have one of our beta J corrections to the maximal Lyapunov exponent. And we're wondering if, if, uh, if we can use these effective field theory methods to understand these corrections and to understand non-maximally chaotic theories. For instance, by thinking of this deviation as some sort of dissipative effect and using, using effective field theory methods to, uh, to describe that. Um, right, but um, so here I'm not so sure about the details, so I'm just going to leave it like that. <laughs> Thank you.